Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Uh, that's what Ezekiel did. Ezekiel chose to be a soldier of the cross and not to avoid the pain and difficulty that that created. There's a sense in which Ezekiel chapters 4 to 11, following on the commissioning in 1 to 3, are a kind of an introduction to the rest of the message up through chapter 24. In many ways, they summarize the reason why destruction is certain. Far from the temple being a protection from harm, in fact, the corrupt temple is actually the reason why harm is coming. So it's the very flip-flop of what they're thinking. We've got God's temple, therefore nothing can happen to us. No, because you have this corrupt temple, something is going to happen to you, something that will not be pleasant at all. And there are several themes introduced here that will show up again later as we go along. So uh, not everybody agrees. Uh, I notice a number of commentaries will simply say chapters 4 to 24 are a unit. Uh, we'll look at this as we go along and talk about it. As I mentioned here, The question of 390 days lying on his side is something of a, a riddle. The 40 years lying on his side for Judah, that's clear enough. Round figures from 586 to 539, 40 years. But why Israel gets 390 years, and in fact, when you begin to add it up and look at it, that really is equal to the span from the division of the kingdom when Solomon died in 930 until 540. So the question may be that indeed God is seeing that whole period as Israel's, the northern kingdom's, separation from Jerusalem. Perhaps that's what's going on there. Um, I think the other things there in the uh, introduction we can uh, pick up on as we go along. Now, immediately in <laughs> question number one, there's an error. It's how many different acted out parables do you find in chapters four and five? <laughs> And if you did three and four uh, and you didn't find any acted out parables in chapter three, uh, that's not surprising. So what are these acted out parables? What's the first one? The city under siege. Yeah, making the model of the city and setting up the uh, iron frying pan against it as a symbol of how firm and harsh it's going to be. So yes, that's the first one. What's the second one then? Yes. Lying on his side for the better part of a year and a half. And the next one? Yes, the foul food. The food of exile. And the last one, <laughs> just put it up there. What's the last one? Shaved head and beard. The shaved head and beard. Yeah. 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 So especially the last three, are all painful, humiliating, hard.
And there is a term that we find. Well, first of all, in chapter 3, verse 3, and is chapter 4, verse 3. Uh -huh. In chapter 4, verse 3, there is a term used for these. What are they? Chapter 4, verse 3. They are signs. In Exodus, the signs are miracles of deliverance. And Jesus, if he was the Messiah, according to the people, was supposed to come up with signs. I suspect they were thinking of plagues on the Romans. Jesus did signs, but not the ones they expected or the ones they wanted. What about these as signs? What are these acted out parables signs of? Signs of judgment. Signs of destruction. Once again, I remind you of my comment about Ezekiel seeing this whole thing as a judge's cycle. Their whole experience from the exodus on until the exile is that descent into being no longer his people. And so instead of the Egyptians experiencing destruction and the people being delivered, the people are going to experience destruction and in Ezekiel's mind, out of that destruction, there will become hope. So these are signs, these are pictures of what is coming ahead. Now, This is the issue that is facing these people. Why do you think God uses these acted out images? Why doesn't Ezekiel just say, <laughs> as he does in many ways, but why begin his ministry with these things? What do you think? Yes, a visual image that is more uh, incorporating all of our senses. Uh, this is, somehow i got to get these people's attention. Uh, remember what the situation is here. Uh, these people have been taken into exile in 598. It's now five years later, 593. This is not the exile that's going to come in 586 where the majority of the people are going to be carried off. This, this is just a select group. And everything that is being said is, there are two things being said. One is, these are the rotten figs that have been taken out of the barrel so the barrel will be fine. Jerusalem is the barrel. The other thing that's being said is, this is not going to last. In a very short time, you are going to go home again. Now these two are sort of contradictory, but we're pretty good at contradictions. And so, there's the message. That's what these people are believing. Either, well, we're, we're no good and, and we've been taken out, or 
it's going to be a short time. He's saying it is over. Jerusalem is what is rotten. And he is forcing them to visualize that fact. Jerusalem is rotten, and you're not going to go home. Not anytime soon. So to try to, in a sense, shock them into recognition, he's doing this. Remember that at this same time, Jeremiah had sent them a letter. He had told them, plant orchards, build houses. You're going to be there. And he got <laughs> verbally beaten up for doing that. So that's the situation in which uh, Ezekiel is called upon for this very shocking behavior. Now look at chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. L then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. So this is not merely a demonstration. What does this make you think of? Jesus, yes, yes. Sin has to be born. Sin has to be carried. The um, term that is used is iniquity. You will bear the iniquity. Iniquity, yes. <laughs> I think just the fact that he was doing it. Mm -hmm. You are doing this because of what Israel has done. Because Israel has committed sin and incurred iniquity. Therefore, here's where we are. We do not have a good English equivalent for iniquity. <laughs> it is an archaic word that is pretty much meaningless to us today. And there's some question what the term actually means in Hebrew. But the best guess, <laughs> more than guess, conclusion at this time is it connotes the reality of sin. When you sin, something comes into existence. We like to say, well, I didn't mean it. So it doesn't matter. Or, eh, it was a little mistake. <laughs> a little slip up. No, no. Sometimes it it will be translated, the Hebrew word, uh, the, it's a good, good Hebrew word. That's the rough guttural, avon, avon. Sometimes it'll be translated guilt. And this is what Sigmund Freud set out to deliver us from. You can be delivered from the iniquity of sin. Well, he may have succeeded, but what he did was to drive it underground. And it has come to the surface in a whole host of mental illnesses. So when we sin, there is something there. 
something that is going to have to be dealt with because it has an objective identity of its own. There are consequences. And in some way, I think that's what iniquity means, the consequences. And those consequences are going to have to be carried. We think, of course, of the Day of Atonement when the second goat carries away the sins of the people into the desert. It's also interesting... The word that means forgiveness comes from the same root as this word, which means to bear. Now, language is, is tricky. And uh, Dr. Kinlaw and I had a little bit of a uh, lover's quarrel on this because a word's etymology, where the word originally came from, may not have much to do with how it is eventually being used. So, to forgive is nasa, and to bear is nasa, to carry. So did people who were using it as forgive remember that it had connections to carry? I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit leery of that. Uh, I'm sure I've told the story here, but I'm up here so I got to tell it again because it's one of my favorites. The guy went to the doctor. He said, Doc, you've got to do something for my wife. I said, oh, what's the trouble? Well, she's unbearable. Oh, you can't stand her. No, no, Doc. She's impregnable. Oh, you can't get through to her. No, Doc. She's inconceivable. Oh, you don't understand her. Doc, I'm telling you, she can't have kids. <laughs> we don't use those words with those original meanings at all. And when we talk about, well, I can't conceive of that, <laughs> we make no connection whatsoever to conception. <laughs> so, so I say all that to say I'm a little careful here, but I'm happy to believe that at least originally there was a connection here. That you, when you forgive someone's sin, there's a sense in which you take that on yourself. You take the consequences on yourself. So that's what's going on here. And as, as we said at the outset, I think there's unquestionably a line here that finds its eventual conclusion in Jesus. When you and I sin, we do something to the fabric of existence that's going to have to be dealt with. If I step in front of a car going 60 miles an hour down the road, there are going to be consequences. I cannot say, oops, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have done that. Let's forget it. No. There are consequences. And that's the point that is being driven home here in this very brief little sentence. You... Now, Ezekiel, can you indeed carry the consequences of your people's sins forever? <laughs> no, not a chance. But there is one who can. There is one who will. 
And so I say a line is being drawn here whose conclusion is in Jesus Christ. Sin is going to have to be carried. Who can do it? <clears throat> now, Danny asked a question at the beginning that is uh, well worth talking about. Throughout the book, Ezekiel is referred to as the son of man. The NRSV translates it human. We toyed with a number of possibilities with, uh, in the NLT. Uh, one of the ones we worked with was mortal. And I don't remember what we landed on. But clearly, Ezekiel is being addressed as a representative human being. And Jesus then loves that term for himself. It's his favorite term. The Son of Man. To drive home that point that yes, I'm God, but I'm also fully human. But I think there is also a connection here. As Ezekiel, the son of man, representatively bore the sins of his people, I, the true son of man, will genuinely bear them. Praise his name. Praise his name. So exactly why God chooses to call Ezekiel this, I don't think is entirely clear. But why Jesus chose to use that term, I think it's quite clear. I am what Ezekiel was representing. Okay. <clears throat> now look at that third sign. Starting verse 9, take wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, spelt, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. Eat it during those 390 days you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Measure out a sixth of a hin of water and drink it at set times. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human dung for fuel. The Lord said in this way the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I'll drive them. And I said, oh no. <laughs> That's the Living Oswald version. I've never defiled myself. From my youth till now, I've never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. God, this is a little much. This is a little much. Very well, he said, I'll let you bake your bread over cow dung. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Now, why would God do this to this called servant, especially called, when he's given him this calling of being a prophet, when priesthood was out of the question for him? Do you think of any other prophets that he treated like this? Hosea. Go marry a prostitute. God, <laughs> did I hear you right? <laughs> yeah. And when she has left you, bearing you children that you're not sure are your own, then go buy her back. That's illegal. In the Torah, you cannot do that. If you... Divorce your wife, 
You cannot remarry her. Assuming she has married someone else. What's God doing? Violating his own Torah. It's pretty quiet in here. Painting a picture of all of his children. I think so. I think with, with Hosea especially, he makes the point that Israel is the prostitute wife. And I married her anyway. And she's borne me children that I'm not sure are mine. And now she's left me. But I don't care. I'm going to marry her back. So you really are seeing this picture. It's not merely that Ezekiel is eating unclean food. There's a real sense in which God has been made unclean by the unclean behavior of his people. So that he really is entering into the anguish of God. And God is entering into his anguish. So there is really this bonding between God and the prophet, which is remarkable. Uh, years ago, I read a series of instructions to preachers. And uh, one of them that I've not forgotten is stay with the fire long enough till you are set on fire. Then go to your pulpit. Mm. Stay with the fire until you are set on fire. And then go to your pulpit. Some people might never get to the pulpit. All right. In many ways, that fourth sign was the most degrading of all. Because for a man in that situation to be shaven, head, beard. Today we have uh, folks who are... Uh, uh, hard-boiled eggs, but uh, in those days, no, no. Utter humiliation. This one, we've got a uh, clear, this is more of a parable than really the other three because we get the explanation down in chapter 5. Take one-third of your hair, take another third, strike it with a sword all around the city, the model city, scatter a third to the wind. So you go down to chapter uh, 5, verse 11, verse 12. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with a drawn sword. Wow. But I want to call your attention to something that isn't mentioned directly. I think it is mentioned, but not directly. Notice what he says. Verse 3 of chapter 5. Take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garments. Take a few of these and throw them into the fire and burn them up. A fire will spread from there to all Israel. Now look at verse 13. 
My anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. Here is the first implication of the return. A third and a third and a third, but take a little scrap. And they will set Israel on fire. I don't think this is the fire of destruction. I think this is the fire of renewal. So that even here in, in these darkest pictures, I think there's this very, very slight implication. This will not be the end. There will come a time when my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. Hmm. This is not forever. This is not forever. Now in verse five, chapter 5, rather, Verse 5, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have sent in the center, set in the center of nations with countries all around her. What's the implication there? Why did God do that? His special people, the center of the universe, with the nations all around. People sometimes say, why in the world did God put Abraham in that God-forsaken place? Well, it isn't a God-forsaken place. In fact, This little area is the crossroads of the world. You've got trade coming up the Red Sea to Damascus, out to Tyre and Sidon, from there to the whole Mediterranean world. You've got the trade coming from Mesopotamia to Egypt and vice versa. You've got out of Central Asia so that this little territory is the hinge of three continents. That marker is dying, I fear. Europe, Africa, and Asia. So in fact, God put his people right in the middle of a superhighway. And they regularly got run over. But that's the place where the greatest possibility for influence in the nations would arise. This, of course, is the tragedy of Solomon. The Solomonic Empire... had a stranglehold on all the communication routes. And he blew it. So God says, I put Jerusalem right in the middle of the nations, right in the center of the nations, where they could potentially have their greatest impact. But what has happened? Verse 7.
you have rebelled more than the nations around you and have not followed my regulations or kept my laws. Excuse me. You've not followed my decrees or kept my regulations. You have not even conformed to the regulations of the nations around you. Oh my goodness. Instead of being an example to them, they have influenced you with the result that you're worse than they are. Oh my. Oh my. What does all that say to the church? <laughs> Need to read Ezekiel. Yep. 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 Getting influence from the world cause the world experience them. Exactly. Are we influencing the world or is the world influencing us? <laughs> yes, yes. Jesus says, don't be surprised. They hated me first. <laughs> but there it is. And, and the word is not merely disobeyed. It is rebelled. I want what I want when I want it, and you, God, are in my way. So, you folks think you're going to go home? You think that maybe you got taken off because you're especially bad? No, no. <laughs> no. Back there, that's what's bad. The holy city. So he says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is what Yahweh God says. I myself am against you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. When your maker is against you, you are in big trouble. It's interesting, in Isaiah, God says that about Babylon. I'm against you. Because you have said, I am and there is no other. God says, here, I'm against you because you've rebelled against me and I'm going to inflict punishment on you in the sight of all those nations. It'll be interesting, I think, in heaven to uh, get in a history seminar and 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 see exactly what people were saying about the destruction of Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. They really offended Yahweh, didn't they? Oh, my goodness. But also, later, Ezekiel is going to tell us they were saying, oh, well, Yahweh couldn't help you, could he? He was too weak to help you. So some interesting responses here on this destruction. He says, verse 9, there is a particular reason why I'm going to do this. 
They're detestable idols. Abomination. An abomination is something that is against the order of creation. So, to make an idol is an abomination. Creation should not be worshipped. The creator is to be worshipped, and creation is to be used. I like what St. Augustine said. Idolatry is to use what should be worshipped and worship what should be used. You have made abominations. So, sexual acts that are not between a male and a female are abominations. They're detestable to God. Not because they're necessarily nasty, although some of them are. But simply because this isn't the way you were made. This isn't the way the world was made. And it's detestable. And an abomination leads to other abominations. Look what it says. Therefore, verse 10, in your midst, parents will eat their children, and children will eat their parents. Abomination leads to abomination. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will shave you. Now, This is in the notes for next week, but I'll, I'll start here. Ezekiel has a favorite word for idols. It only occurs a few other times in the Bible, and uh, as I recall, 25 or 30 times in Ezekiel. It is the word gilulim. Virtually every time your English translation says idols, this is the word that he's using. In Hebrew, that's im is plural. The root of the word then is G-L-L. G-L-L means round. One noun from it is waves, rollers. Another word that comes from it is calves. Ever seen calves in the spring? <laughs> so these are round things, round things, uh-huh. Can't prove it. Almost certainly, these are the round things that are left in the road when a herd of animals has gone by. A good Anglo-Saxon translation. You want to worship those things? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. And it's a bit the more shocking because, in general, Ezekiel's language is pretty elegant. And it's the more shocking when he brings this in. 
These things are abominations. They are filth. They are in defiance of the way God has made the world. Whew. <laughs> Tell us what you feel, <laughs> Ezekiel. <laughs> now, we're, we're getting the first taste here of language that is going to occur again and again up through 24. I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you. You will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and an object of horror around to the nations around you. When I inflict punishment on you in anger and in wrath and with stinging rebuke, I, the Lord, have spoken. When I shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you. They will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, Yahweh, have spoken. Now, <laughs> what do we do with stuff like that? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild? If God is good and gracious and forgiving? How are we to explain this fury and rage? He's a God of wrath as well as a God of love. Okay, he has a limit. But couldn't he just say, that is a bad thing and you are going to be punished for it. Expect it, it's coming. Why, why this, this <laughs> overkill, if you will, in terms of language? It's a He's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Come to the end. He's been patient with them for a thousand years. They first broke the covenant five weeks after they made it and swore in blood that they would keep it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's after they say first I didn't do it Okay. 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 It is, I think, precisely because we are so precious to him. Precisely because he loves us so deeply that he is so furious at what we have done to ourselves. Notice there's not much through here of what you have done to me. And we do have that, re you've rebelled against me. But by and large, it is simply, you've made a whole series of terrible choices. You have corrupted yourself, you have defiled yourself. And because I love you so much, my reaction is so strong. Yes. You hear that, that phrase, only 
someone who loves you so much, you can only hurt that person that who loves you so much. Yes. You, you can't truly hurt someone else that doesn't have feelings for you. Exactly. So, exactly. Yes, yes, that's exactly, and that's, that's, where, that's where sort of Linda started, that, that you can't have his love without his anger. They are two sides of the same coin. He is not the force. Star Wars? The force doesn't care what you do. The force is only interested in maintaining, <coughs> I don't know whether I can draw this right or not, but I'll try. <coughs> the force is only interested in maintaining yin and yang. balancing the white and the dark. So these people on the dark side, eh, they're getting a little bit heady. I think I'll kill the Death Star. Ah, now these people over here, they think they got it all made, don't they? Well, I'll fix that. Just a neutral balance is all the force cares about. And this book says, oh no, no, no. The being that is at the heart of the universe is passionate. He loves passionately and he hates passionately. And you can't have the one without the other. They go together. I have a daughter. She was beginning to date. And the people she was dating, <coughs> I did not approve of. Karen said, if you keep on meeting those guys at the front door, she will never get a date. And I said, that's OK with me. <laughs> it was because I cared about her. And I didn't want to see her ruining her life. And that's what we see here with God. And so this old business of, well, I'd rather have the New Testament God of love than the Old Testament God of wrath. <coughs> Give me a break. <laughs> it's not one or the other, and you can't have one or the other. The two Testaments have to be read together. And when you read them together, <laughs> you get the impression that Jesus was kind of mad at those Pharisees. Brood of snakes, whitewater, whitewashed sepulchers. <laughs> and of course, as I've had reason to say to you before, without Jesus, we would have no doctrine of hell. Jesus is the one who talks about outer darkness where there is gnashing of teeth. And in the Old Testament, 250 times, a God of hesed, a God of steadfast, unfailing love. OK. So then, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 5 are really a mirror image of verse 5. I set you in the midst of the nations for you to be an example. So you're going to be in the midst of the nations. A ruin and a reproach. A reproach and a taunt. A warning and an object of horror. So 
he's saying, you had your choice, you had your opportunity to be what you were meant to be, and you would not do that. So now, the mirror image is going to come to pass. Well, as I warned you at the beginning, this is pretty dark, <laughs> and it's going to keep being dark as Ezekiel tries to drive this message home. You think that your religion is a protection from harm. In fact, your religion is the cause of what's going to happen to you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> is it I, Lord? May it never be. Other comments, questions, observations before we close? Okay. What's wrong with the world today? People do not fear God. Yeah, yeah. I, I had an interesting um, uh, email conversation this week. A friend of mine is writing a novel. It, well, it's really kind of an allegorical novel, and uh, uh, he talks about the fear of God, and he sent the uh, draft to a pretty well-known uh, Christian writer, and he responded pretty forcefully about uh, that, that my friend should not bring the fear of God into this uh, because uh, Jesus has done away with the fear of God. <laughs> Now, this is a guy, well, I'll, I'll say, he's one of the co-authors of the book, The Shack. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I confess I was shocked. And he quoted, as, as is often done, 1 John says, perfect love drives out fear. We're not talking about the fear of God in 1 John. We're talking about the fear of condemnation. If God has made your heart whole, you're not afraid of being condemned. That's not the fear of God. The fear of God is, as I've said to you before, two things. Number one, there is a God. Number two, he's not you. <laughs> That's the fear of God. <laughs> to Conduct your life in the knowledge that there is a God to whom you're accountable. That's it. It's not walking around, where is he going to hit me next? I'm going to live in the sight of a God who holds me accountable. And by God's grace, with the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to live there. So yes, yes, there is very little fear of God in the world today. Exactly, exactly. Well, he's loved me. He's, he's, he's been so good to me. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. It is, it is the awe of God, a God of that kind of power, that kind of glory, that kind of majesty, who loves me? Oh my goodness, on my face. Yes, Tom. It would displease the world. Yes. Young and in love, <laughs> desperately afraid of doing anything that would displease the loved one. Yes, yes. All right, anything else? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you love us this passionately, that you love us this deeply, this strongly. Thank you. Help us, O oh Lord to love you in return. Thank you. Thank you.
for what you have done for us in Jesus. Thank you that you have borne our sins and carried them away. Thank you that we may live for you. Oh God, make us tender-hearted. Make us, make me, not one who says, what can I get away with and still get in? Make me, make us, people who say, how close can I live to my Savior? In your name we pray, amen. amen.